Spanning the globe, it's World Affairs Roundup. The Institute of World Affairs at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee presents World Affairs Roundup, a monthly edition of International Focus, providing opinion and analysis of global events, with John Kotzka, a retired member of the U.S. Foreign Service, Anne Hamilton, political scientist at UW-Whitewater, who also served in the U.S. Foreign Service, and Robert Craig, executive director of Citizen Action of Wisconsin and author of articles and books on American foreign policy. Support provided by Milwaukee Public Television and the UWM Center for International Education. Now, here's your moderator, Doug Savage. Welcome to International Focus and another edition of our World Affairs Roundup. Our Roundup regulars have returned from their palatial summer estates, rested and refreshed, and ready to proffer penetrating punditry on the deal with Damascus. Barack Obama was given a way out of a red line demarcated corner by Syria's backer in chief, Vladimir Putin. Who got the better of it, and how's the deal holding up? What's bugging Brazil? Brazilian President Dilma Rousseff canceled an official visit to Washington after materials from leaker Edward Snowden revealed the NSA has monitored Rousseff's telephone calls and email, spied on communications by her aides, and targeted Brazil's biggest company, Petrobras. Is this a serious rift, or will she soon be sharing a samba with Obama? Worn out welcome. China's recent deals in several African nations have encountered unprecedented local pushback. Is Beijing's unfettered conspicuous consumption on the continent coming to an end? And will the new deals actually benefit more Africans? And suddenly single. As Germans go to the polls in parliamentary elections this weekend, there's a real chance that Angela Merkel's coalition partners may be tossed out of government. How might her alternative political fellows change their nation's course and with it, the Eurozone. Well, welcome back, everyone. Trust you had a good summer. John, maybe we could uh, start out with Syria. And what is the deal that has been struck? Well, the deal is that Secretary of State Kerry and Russian uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov have agreed to a framework which is presented to the UN Security Council, which is not yet, as we tape this, uh, worked out the final modalities for an agreement uh, that would, by which uh, Syria would give up its uh, chemical weapons by 2014. Think of it like almost out of Hollywood. Here we are, about a week ago, the, two sec the secretary and the foreign minister come up with this agreement, and the world collectively sighed with relief. <laughs> the president, because he wasn't sure where he was going on this issue and had an extremely reluctant Congress and a public that was not backing a policy, he had a belligerent John McCain who was looking for some sort of military action. He had a rather stumbling secretary of state whose press spokesman had to walk him back from a statement he made that led to this agreement. So it became a very complicated thing. There are new winners and new losers. But what bothers me most about this is a principle called uh, the responsibility to protect, R2P. And this has been become certainly the mantra of this administration, but it was for previous administrations as well. And I, what concerns me, there's no strategy involved in this. It is, it is reactive. We neither have the resources nor do we have the, the, uh, a common de set of definitions on how to apply it, nor do we, are we willing to apply it universally. So we end up looking bad when we don't apply it, and we end up looking bad when we do apply it. So I see it as a problem. So, Anne, was this a, a problem that had its origins in the red line that we prefer not have been crossed? Well, in part, I mean, there have been a series of mistakes that have been made. I think that um, Obama making the statement that, you know, the chem use of chemical weapons was a red line <clears throat> that couldn't be crossed was definitely a mistake. And the first mistake, um, if he was going to make that, then, and we were going to respond, then we should have responded at the first use of chemical weapons, which was well documented, although there was more controversy 
at that time um, as to who actually had used the chemical weapons. Um, but yeah, he did back himself into, into a corner. Um, but then it became, the, all the blustering became about, you know, how does this make the United States look, you know, instead of really thinking about, well, what's the real problem here and how do we need to solve it? It became, I mean, I think that the idea of needing to go to war, um, although they weren't calling it a war, but needing to, you know, have a military strike uh, because he said that, you know, unless it really makes sense, is, is, is there's something wrong about that. So, Robert, on balance, is this a good thing that he was able to get out of that box, or uh, is is it a, just a net loss for the administration? It would be better if they weren't in this position in the first place, but it's a, it's a net gain not to have done it, because I agree with Anne this is, and John, this is tactics without a strategy. And so it seems to me there's this chemical weapon kind of argument or talking point that is really there, but they're really about doing something in what's happening in Syria and what's being done to the people in Syria, but unwilling to say that directly, and then finding the chemical weapon pretext, when in fact a lot more people have died from conventional weapons. This line between chemical and conventional weapons right. doesn't make a lot of ethical sense. And so John's right, we have this responsibility to protect, we think, but we, we do it very unevenly. We also, I think, this is a matter of having this forward military posture along the, around the world when we are, in many ways, declining power, when you have that kind of capacity, then you, it feels like you have an ethical obligation, such as you, you're an armed guard and you see a crime occurring in front of you, but then you don't want to get involved in, in the internal affairs of every country. We're inconsistent in it. So it, it's been a mess because it's been tactic to tactic. We need to resolve the question of whether we had a moral obligation to do something in Syria and then do it on those grounds rather than this chemical weapons of diffusion. Then the, the bad diplomacy led to Putin being able to both uh, do something good in terms of uh, he actually did uh, disengage the situation, but then of course it was a great diplomatic victory for Russia, uh, which is I think less less of a bad thing than what would have happened if we just lobbed cruise missiles into Syria with no good reason. So and, let's, and people keep dying too. Yes, I mean, it's exactly. not as if people aren't still being right, killed right. Uh, during the civil war while all this is going on. So it's very problematic. So we we talked a little bit about sort of what was in play for the Obama administration. What Iron did uh, Putin have in the fire in all of this? Well, he, Putin has a as as a stake in Syria, a long term relationship. Mm -hmm. uh, they have a base there, uh, but Putin also was interested in reestablishing himself on the international front, and and, and this did more for him in that respect than almost anything else before. Uh, there, there was a, a in their minds how badly they came off the Kosovo. Uh, intervention where they captured the airport and then were left there and everything moved around them and they were ignored. Uh, this time they're not being ignored. They are, they, they are still wrestling with the language that's going to go into this Security Council resolution about what level of force could be uh, uh, applied to this. And I, I, my suspicion is that it's going to be very, very weak language in that respect. Well, and having gotten out of the box of, uh, you know, this is a red line where we have to use military force, how much tolerance and patience will there be in uh, the implementation of this deal? I mean, is there a credible American military option left on the table at this point, regardless of, of how much cooperation we see on, uh, on the part of the Assad regime? You're assuming that there was a credible military option on the table before. Well, to do something, I mean, certainly. Well, I think he ceded it to Congress, which made sense politically. It was a deft political move, actually, but it was done in retreat and tactically. But now he said that, that the people's representative should decide. It's hard to walk that back. <laughs> well, uh, let's move <laughs> to a different hemisphere and Brazil and uh, talk a little bit about uh, what, what the latest round of leaks have wrought in that quarter. <laughs> well, um, the you know the revelation as you said in the introduction that that the NSA had been spying on both uh, Dilma Rousseff's uh, personal emails as well as the Petrobras emails and all sorts of other people was taken very badly um, by people in the country and her decision to cancel the first state visit by uh, to the United States since 1995. Um, was a big decision, and Obama did try and talk her out of it in a long phone call. 
um, but she stuck to it, and probably primarily for domestic reasons. Um, the revelations are very unpopular in the country. As uh, someone said, she couldn't be seen in an evening gown dancing with Obama or Obama. And, um, <laughs> and so, um, you know, and, and elections are coming up next year, and there have been protests as a result of all the, the building of um, uh, infrastructure for the World Cup and the Olympics and ignoring the needs of the poor. And so it's, it's, it's been, she's in a, on a, in a difficult political situation at home. So this is primarily to gain political capital at home, I think. And are there any sort of short-term, we assume this is not a, an irreparable long-term rift between the two countries, but are there any short-term U.S. interests at stake? Well, I mean, first of all, I mean, just we have this incredibly aggressive national security uh, apparatus designed for the Cold War, which continues bureaucratic inertia. And what good does it do us to be able to, to despoil relations, at least temporarily, with the second largest country in the Western Hemisphere? So the, the head of Brazil can't be seen with Obama publicly, but he can walk around beaches with Chris Christie in New Jersey over <laughs> floods and natural disasters. That's the situation we're in. And it's, the Snowden uh, revelations are very embarrassing. It's led to Brazil to talk about cutting off its internet that may not be workable, but that is that is extremely damaging to Silicon Valley and to American interests because of the importance of, of the internet to to, uh, to to American industry and development. And so, I think that it's it's highly problematic, and I doubt we learned anything very interesting about uh, about <laughs> about the prime minister's personal life or or anything else. By, we just had extra spying capacity, so we use it. It, it, it just it surprises me to a degree the level of of reaction. Um, everyone does it who can. Uh, this is not new. This has been going on for a long time. Uh, short of Colonel House saying that gentlemen don't read other gentlemen's mail. Uh, <laughs> Colonel House reference, I like that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is a normal thing. Uh, her, Anne referred to her domestic issues. This is a good way to deflect them. Uh, there, there is also uh, uh, there are taxes that they're talking about, onerous taxes on the Internet companies, in addition to building up their mm -hmm. own infrastructure. I suspect she is very upset with her own IT people who were not able mm -hmm. to protect her in her conversations in this process. But well, what about, uh, does, it, does it bring up a bigger issue of, of sort of sovereignty and, and information and privacy? I mean, are we likely to see any moves by governments to really try to sort of insulate and isolate their national information infrastructure. Well, overhanging this whole thing is this 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 bad this boogeyman called protectionism, and uh, you know I'm not so sure that this is the right reference to that point. But as you begin to become more insular, this begins to eat away at that connectivity that globalization is all about. And we've seen with other countries attempting to insulate themselves. China, for example, that it, 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 there's a certain amount of success, but not for, you know, they can't completely insulate themselves. So it doesn't, in the long run, it doesn't work. And it does move very much against their business interests, I think. Look, and I know, as John says, everyone does it. And in foreign policy world, this is standard procedure. But <laughs> is it really necessary in a post-Cold War world to, to, to snoop on Brazil? I, I add, particularly when we're, we have Congress uh, this week cutting food stamps, for example. I mean, I, I, it's interesting how the inertia goes on that because we have done it, built this apparatus, it gets used, no matter whether it's a good reason or not. This might not be the right forum to discuss that. <laughs> <laughs> well, in ah, any case, you're cut us off from that. <laughs> in any case, uh, we're going to take a short break before we discuss anything else, and we'll be right back with more. The Institute of World Affairs presents our community with a range of public programs relating to global issues, U.S. foreign policy, and the world economy. For more information about the Institute of World Affairs, call 414-229-3220 or visit our website at www.iwa.uwm.edu. Welcome back to International Focus and our World Affairs Roundup. Well, let's jump now to yet another continent and uh, talk a little bit about China and its interest on uh, the African continent. 
Uh, as of late, there's been surprising pushback to some of the deals that they've been making, but I'll just throw it open to anyone. I mean, let's talk a little bit about what the, the relationship has been historically between China and Africa, beginning with, uh, with sort of the Mao era. Well, I mean, there's a long tradition of China uh, opening to Africa. And the original, you know, appeal really was we're both developing countries working together, right? And we're not going to judge you and, and mess with your internal affairs, which is a, a, a traditional Chinese foreign policy line uh, for the last century. Uh, and so China has made very large investments there, has strong relationships. There are over 800,000, I think, Chinese in Africa. And, uh, they, and they've tried to line up a lot of mineral rights and oil rights. And they, they They've had so much power, so to speak, that African countries really have not wanted to stand up to them at all, despite environmental pollution, mistreatment of workers, etc. And now you're really being to see, at least in parts of Africa, a series of examples of African leaders pushing back. So I think that there is a backlash going on, and some and and a lot of African leaders are feeling trampled upon and feeling they can get better deals because these deals haven't necessarily they've been good for African elites, but they haven't been necessarily very good at lifting uh, wage standards or developing Africa per se. It's really a, it's an old mercantilist kind of relationship where you provide the raw materials, get manufactured goods back, and 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 remain poor in the transaction. Well, and the the whole you know southern hemisphere solidarity is is a little bit tougher case to make these days, with given the the status of the Chinese economy, isn't it? I mean, yes, is, it is. And, and during the Cold War, it was very much about um, not only about you know solidarity for. Um, South, you know, developing countries, but very much for ideological purposes, not only anti-capitalism, but also trying to win um, uh, allies against the Soviet Union once the Sino uh, Soviet split occurred. So um, there were large development projects in Africa going on at that time, but they were very much for Cold War purposes. They weren't because of ne necessarily for economic reasons. And when you think about the Chinese economy then, it wouldn't have made sense for economic reasons. But now, given the changes in the economy, the industrialization, the huge growth in China, they very much need the resources. So it has changed a lot, as Robert said. So we know, you know, sort of the, the posture of, of China vis-a-vis -vis their African customers has changed. What, what's changed among the governments in Africa that are, are suddenly deciding to rethink some of these deals? Well, I think there's a chronological question here, too. The early agreements that the Chinese did were in West Africa. And those are the ones where you're beginning to see the pushback. Uh, they probably were done with strong men who received uh, enormous compensation for the agreements. Uh, and either they're gone or or they they've spent that compensation. Hard bit overseas. <laughs> but then there is now some new agreements that the Chinese are are doing with uh, Kenya on the east side and uh, Tanzania, where there seems to be more uh, observance on the Chinese part to putting together better deals on for the for the host countries. One of the things that that flows through this. And, and is not dissimilar to a lot of aid that goes out. There's an awful lot of Chinese companies, construction companies, experts, whatever, who come in, just like our own aid programs. Uh, we bring in a lot of uh, Americans to, to do these projects, while the Chinese are even more aggressive in this regard. So what about uh, one interesting area in which China seems to be investing heavily is media on the continent. Let's ah. talk a little bit about that. Yes, they're they're entering into deals uh, for they have the Xinhua, the the state um, uh, uh, radio channels has has thirty bureaus um, around Africa. They um, are investing heavily in newspapers. Um, in um, it, particularly in South Africa and Kenya, most recently, but um, they're they're pretty much all over the continent, except in um, places that recognize Taiwan. So you mm -hmm. know they're not they're not interested in doing business with them. Um, but yeah, they're really they're really making a presence, and they're trying to compete, particularly in Kenya, with the BBC and CNN, and um, really offer an alternative source of information, their version. And. Well, and they're not shy about censorship. Mm -hmm. So unfriendly things are not said about 
China and not said about China's allies. You mean the regime? The regime is not a word. That, it's not. It's not a word they would use. So they don't. They don't even. The reporter is self-censored. I even bother asking about human rights violations if they know that that a leader is is well regarded as a good relationship with China. Just for example, along the spirit of non-interference, I'm sure. <laughs> so so, what do we think? Is kind of the takeaway? Is this uh, ultimately a, a positive for these governments? I mean, is it sustainable? Are they going to be able to cut better deals? Or I think they are beginning to cut better deals. I think. Uh, also, I think with the economic downturn, China is not being nearly as aggressive as it was before, and therefore this might take off some of the tensions that are involved. Well, yet another continent now, uh, and the parliamentary elections in Germany. First of all, I think uh, it's, it's more or less accepted as a given that Angela Merkel will in one form Continue. Or uh, so the the question is, what will the the coalition look like? John, talk a little bit about who's in her government right now, and and what might some of the alternatives be? Uh, the Free Democrats are their 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 partner in this government, uh, but they are in danger of not reaching the threshold of five percent in order to be able to continue. As if so I, if you don't get five percent of the vote, yeah. you don't get you to don't, be you, in you government. You don't get to be in government. And so it is, the, the pundits are thinking that it is going to be a new coalition. It could be a grand coalition, but uh, the chances of that, of the Greens joining, are, are not likely. So this, no matter, no one is thinking that she is not going to be part of this. In some ways, this, this really is not as big an issue as, as people would think. It is unlikely that they're going to change their policies on, on the Eurozone or the EU. It's unlikely that they're going to increase domestic consumption in order to be able to, uh, to push, to, to, to uh, cut down the costs. It's unlikely that, uh, that they're going to be doing anything different than they're doing now whatever coalition they put together. Well, let's, let's take a step back then. What, what makes Germany fundamentally different than the rest of Europe at this point? Well, it's, it's calling all the economic shots. I mean, <laughs> it, it, it pretty much is, it has the strongest economy and it, it has been asked to bail out uh, countries that are suffering in the, in the Eurozone that have, whose economies are tanking. Um, and pretty much it holds, you know, it holds the cards. So the, it, if, if it, what it decides to do will largely determine the future of the euro. Well, and so. is there a certain tension within German society of feeling ill-used, and why are we bailing out the Greeks so they can sail around the Aegean happily and retire at 50 when we're hardworking at our Audi plants and whatever, versus the desire to be really the the first among, if not equals, in, in Europe? I mean, a European leader. Well, that's in a nutshell why the election won't change things very much, because the range of German opinion on this is pretty narrow. And so they're judgmental of the southern countries in the Eurozone, think it's their fault, but don't see why hardworking Germans. Very nicely, right. thank you. Right, and, uh, and so they're, they're going to continue to pursue our sincerity. You might have some movement in the margins if the coalition is with the Social Democrats, but bear in mind, the last time there was a Social Democrat coalition, they signed off and led in that coalition on cutting back Germany's social welfare programs and pension benefits dramatically, So and, and are still in hot water with their own base and constituents over that. And so even though International Focus has called the race for Angela already, and we, we, even, well, we don't know what the coalition's going to be, it's hard to imagine any combination that would dramatically change change German policy, and therefore the Eurozone will keep slogging along with its current austerity position. There is a wild card, and this is a new political party called Alternative für Deutschland. It is a Eurosceptic party, and it's the only one of the parties that is Eurosceptic. And if they get 5 percent, this could change certain economics, maybe not for this election or for this, this new government, but in the longer term, because we're seeing in other northern European countries a ratcheting back of some of the welfare state mm -hmm. uh, conditions because of economic conditions. Germany is doing splendidly right now because, you know, for all the propping up they're doing of the southern tier, they're also pulling in, the, the, guess who they're buying from? It's, it's from Germany. 
They're the their exports is what's driving Germany. So, despite what uh, might appear in a description of each of these parties, is, is there really that little ideological range in practice? On which issue? I mean, if you're talking about the Euro continental politics, I don't think there is a, a significant range. Right, in terms of the, the Euro. I mean, the Social Democrats would like to, ha to have some additional social welfare guarantees within Germany. They're not going to be. They're not going to get a majority by any standard. So they're going to have to work in coalition at best uh, with with Merkel. And so there isn't going to be major change. But as far as the euro, there, there's the range of opinion seems pretty narrow in the attitude towards the southern tier of eurozone countries. And the the their current coalition partner, the FDP, is that right? Mm -hmm. um, is much more um, pro capital. I mean, they 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 would like to um, actually. Um, you know, they're upset about the spending even that, that Angela Merkel's um, proposing. You know, she wants to uh, help single mothers and help uh, renters, you know, in their leases and all. So she's, you know, she's, she's not, um, the, the other party is much farther to the right, so, but they're the ones who would like, may, may well lose, so. Okay, well, you heard it here first, Miracle in a Landslide. <laughs> to our viewers, we'll no, no, see you no next Landstein, time. No Landstein, no <laughs> Landstein. On International Focus. information about the Institute of World Affairs and its many programs, or to become a member of the Institute, call 414-229-3220, or visit us at our website, 